God's grace, mercy, and peace are yours in his Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Text for the sermon today are the two uh, gospel readings that we've heard already, so let's bow our heads and begin with a prayer. O Lord, open my mouth that my lips would speak your truth. By that truth, help us to face one another because you have faced all of our sins for us. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, as you know, this Lent we are making that long and deliberate journey with Jesus to Jerusalem for him to die on the cross. And as I've been telling you since Ash Wednesday, it's not supposed to be an easy journey for us to make, even though we're not Jesus. And that's because along the way, we're supposed to face a few things we'd rather not. So far, for instance, we have faced things like temptation, like our sinfulness, like our fears and our worldliness. Before we get to Jerusalem, we're going to face things like uh, the road, which is the Palm Sunday sermon. I'm kind of looking forward to that one. Uh, but also denial and death. Today, as you can tell from the bulletin cover, we're talking about facing one another. And we've already heard in the liturgy some of the things that make that difficult. Things like bitterness, malice, anger, rage, all those things obviously divide people. But without minimizing those and how destructive they can be, I want to actually talk about the result of those things, often the result of those things in people's relationships. I want to talk about a force that really can prevent us from facing one another on an almost primal gut level. I want to talk about shame. Shame. Specifically, how it complicates our relationships and then what Jesus has done about it and then I guess finally what we can do because what Jesus has done for us. I guess maybe before we really get into how it hurts our relationship, we might want to acknowledge that many think shame is an antiquated notion that it's passé, that it no longer has a place in our modern world. And I guess if you just sort of think off the top of our head, there are so many things today that are spoken about openly and maybe on top of that admitted to without blushing, where a generation ago, not even a generation ago, a few years ago, you just never would even speak about such things in, in polite company. One of the things that kind of still surprises me as a pastor is when people, they know who I am and what I do, and they'll say things like, yeah, me and my girlfriend, we got in a car and we drove to Florida and had a nice spring break. Separate rooms? Separate rooms? Well, why would we do that? We're living together. You're not embarrassed by that? Doesn't register that that might be an immoral arrangement? That a Christian wouldn't want to do that? Nope. Before I go too far off the tracks and preach that sermon that I've preached before, <laughs> let's just admit that the list, the list of behaviors that not so long ago were universally viewed as shameful, but now have become not only accepted, but celebrated. Let's just admit up front that that list is long and it's growing. At the same time, though, don't think that because of it, shame is ever going to go away. In fact, in some quarters of our society, shame is making a comeback. For instance, last year a woman in Cleveland, Ohio was caught driving her SUV on the sidewalk around a school bus in order to avoid it. She was in a hurry. Like I said, she was caught, tried, and convicted, and the judge offered her either the statutory penalties and fines for her crime, or she could pick a shaming sentence, which she did pick which meant that 
for two days she had to stand at the busy intersection where she did this, holding a sign for everybody to see which read, only an idiot would drive on the sidewalk to avoid a school bus. That's a shaming sentence. Those are coming back. Once in a while on the news around here, you'll hear of someone who like embezzled from, from an elementary school PTA, and they end up holding a sign in the parking lot as all the parents drop the kids off, saying, I stole from your kid. There's a long tradition of shaming sentences in American history going back to Nathaniel Hawthorne's novel, The Scarlet Letter, in Puritan, Massachusetts. I always think, I mean, you remember, on, it's, I, think, I don't think it's there anymore, but down by the drag strip on 131, just before you get off the Otsego, the first Otsego exit, they built the US 131 Motor Sports Park, that big drag strip right there. Do you remember, do you remember when the state of Michigan put a sign amongst all the tree stumps that the drag strip had cut down? Remember what the sign said? The sign said, these trees were cut illegally. They put a permanent sign up there to shame the owners of that drag strip who cut trees down that were just on the other side of their property line in order for passers-by on the highway to see, see the, the speedway. I remember that. That's the real reason why these trees along Wolverine have not yet been cut down. <laughs> Rockford Church desecrates environment. Story at 11. Target 8 would be all over that, so that would be just horribly embarrassing. But that's really not the kind of shame I want to talk about with you today. Not the kind that merely elicits a, a chuckle at someone else's expense. Rather, the kind of shame we need to talk about is the kind that interferes with, if not destroys, relationships with one another because it's so painfully humiliating to the point that you can't face one another because of it. That's what Peter experienced as the result of his denying his Lord. The shame was so bad, he couldn't face Jesus. Literally. In fact, the Gospel of Luke adds a detail that you didn't hear today when those segments were read that after Peter uttered his third denial, it says that Jesus, wherever he was, it must have been like a big open area in the courtyard of the high priest. He must have been on the other side of it. But it says after Peter denied Jesus the third time, it says Jesus turned around and looked at Peter. And that look, coupled with a rooster crowing, triggered an overwhelming sense of shame in Peter that led him to break down. I've often wondered what, what look Jesus gave him. What do you think? Anger? Disappointment? Disgust? Understanding? Did he give him a blank look? For our purposes today, I guess it doesn't really matter because the shame didn't come from Jesus to Peter. The shame was inside of Peter. Jesus' look just elicited it. And that's the first point I want to make about shame. Shame is not something imposed on us by others. Not even by grumpy old pastors or a puritanical society with outdated mores. Shame is not even something imposed on us by God. Shame is an emotion that's inside of us, generated by our own consciousness of our own guilt. What makes shame, and, and, and honestly, we usually can deal with that without feeling a lot of shame. I sin all the time, I'm a poor, miserable sinner, and we just live with it. But when someone else suddenly understands the full extent of our guilt, and we realize they know this about us, like Peter knew Jesus knew, 
That's when shame becomes painful and debilitating and divisive. That's when it hurts. Like I said, in Peter's case, Jesus was the one who knew. The one Peter earlier had sworn up and down that he would never deny him, even if the rest of the disciples did. He would die for Jesus before he would deny him, even though Jesus predicted it was coming. Jesus was the one who knew what Peter said. Jesus, the one that Peter had earlier said was the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is who knew how guilty Peter was. Who is it for you? Now, of course, it's Jesus. He knows everything. But I'm talking about a real person. Not that Jesus isn't real, but someone in your life. Who is it for you? Is it, this is more than someone you've sinned against, either in thought, word, or deed, things left done or undone. This is someone who's caught you with your hand in the proverbial cookie jar, with your pants down, with no excuse or explanation, buck naked guilty as sin. You may not have thought about that person for a long time, but even this morning, with that just little couple sentences of introduction, it makes you squirm in your seat. That's how powerful shame is. Chances are the person who has caught you like this, obviously bald face without excuse in a sin, they may not even be in your life anymore. They're just too hard to face. That's how painfully powerful shame can be. And that brings me to the second point I want to make about it. Shame, since it, and since it is an emotion, can be manipulated. It can be dulled, like we talked about at the beginning of the sermon. Society has kind of dulled its sense of shame. But on the other hand, it can also be made to blow things out of proportion. By that I mean, shame seems to amplify the real guilt that we feel. It seems to shout inside our heads louder and louder and louder and louder to the point that it convinces us that everybody else is just as focused on our guilt as we are, when in truth, most of them probably don't care or know. They've moved on. And what happens when you think everybody else can only see your guilt? The natural thing is to push away from them. Do you ever think that the reason why that person you caught red-handed has been avoiding you isn't because they're upset with you? It could well be that they can't face you. They're too ashamed. Do you realize that some people commit sins in their life that so shame them that they even push away from God? Can't bring themselves to show their face in church. I'm surprised as a pastor how often that's the reason. Not laziness not indifference, but shame over a sin they committed is the reason why someone stays away. And that's extra sad because our Savior is the one who can help, maybe the only one. You know, you got to give Peter some credit. You've got to give Peter some credit. It had to be hard for him to go back 
to his brother disciples after what he did. Not only had he denied Jesus, but before he did that, he basically said, well, I could see all these other guys might deny you, but I won't. And then he goes ahead and does it. It had to be hard to go back and be with them. Most would not show their face in that group after what he did. But there Peter was on that Sunday morning in the upper room with his brother disciples when word came that the tomb of Jesus was empty and that some angels had a message, not only for all the disciples, but, you know, one of the messages, they singled Peter out. One of the angels told the women, oh, go tell his disciples and Peter, blah, blah, blah. He said, you've got to give Peter some credit. I probably would have ran away if I would have got that message, given all the shame I was feeling that morning. But Peter ran to the tomb. But still, all was not well with Peter. His shame was still separating from his Lord because it says that while Peter saw the burial cloths all folded up, he saw that it was empty. It says the other disciple who got there, John, was the one who believed. Not Peter. And then later in that afternoon, our risen Lord and Savior took pains to appear to Peter personally and privately. And then later that Sunday night, he appeared to Peter and the other disciples in that upper room. And again and again, Peter reached, or Jesus reached out to Peter because of his shame, right up to what you heard in the second gospel that we heard today, where Jesus had to repeatedly, not once, not twice, not three times, boy, that can't possibly be a coincidence, three times assure Peter of his status as an apostle, even though he had denied his Lord. Three times Jesus had to assure Peter that Jesus still had work for him to do. And that brings me to the final point I'd like to make about shame this morning. This is an important one. Jesus doesn't, does not deal with shame so much as he deals with guilt. Jesus did not suffer and die on the cross to change how we feel. Jesus suffered and died on the cross in order to change how God sees us. He died on the cross to change our status before the Almighty. From sinner to saint. From guilty as sin to not guilty in his sight. That's what the biblical word justified means. Jesus died to take away the very thing shame needs in order to survive. Guilt. If you have no guilt beaten in your heart, you can't feel ashamed. So Jesus died and rose again to say you're not guilty and invite you to believe that's true. When we do, it does kind of affect how we feel. Some days more than others. Other days less than others. We are just people after all. But we should be people who can remember a few other things about Jesus. Like how he died. Nailed, literally naked, to a cross for all to see, the whole world, which mocked and scorned him. Jesus knows something about shame. He's already suffered yours on that cross. We also can remember what he did with Peter and realize that he's not put off when you and I 
take time to get over our shame. He's not up in heaven saying, for crying out loud, how many times do I have to tell you you're forgiven? He understands that just a couple words don't just make it go away like magic. Pain or shame is powerful. And our emotions are funny. So he's not put out or averse to not once, not twice, not three times, but 70 times seven, continuing to reassure us of our status before our Heavenly Father on account of what he did. He wants us to believe that so that we can live forever, yes, but also so that we can get past our shame and thus face one another. What I'd like you to do with this sermon and these concepts is take this home and pray about it. Pray first about your status before God, that not guilty status given to you through faith in Christ. Ask God that it would be deepened and made more real to you so that with strength and wisdom you can get past your shame. The other thing I'd like you to pray about, or maybe a different thing to pray about depending on your situation, is for God to open up your eyes and heart to others around you who might be dealing with shame. They might frustrate you. They might be a big question mark to you the way they behave. Lord, open my... Are they dealing with shame, God? Is that why? Help me see that if they are and help me be your instrument to them, assuring them of the same status Jesus gave them. And letting them know through me of your love and acceptance. Shame can be a powerfully destructive force in relationships. But it doesn't have to be like that forever. Not when our Savior's faced it for us. And then in his grace and mercy, we can face each other for him. Amen. Please stand.